continuing in this attitude of prayer and thinking upon the goodness and the love and kindness of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the stillness of this moment, I want to invite you, no matter if you're online or on site or you're in the family experience, just to take a moment and bow your head and close your eyes, not because there's something more spiritual about that, but it's something that helps us to focus. And in that moment, I want you to take and consider the condition of your soul. Today is the Lord's day. We have gathered to worship. We will soon come to his table and celebrate all of the goodness that we enjoy because of Jesus Christ. But the scripture gives us this admonition that before we come to the table, that we should take a moment and examine ourselves to see whether or not we are in the faith. To take a moment and consider the quality of our love for Jesus. And so there where you are. Let this not be a thing that you are afraid to go to your Savior, but instead, let us approach his throne of grace with confidence, knowing that we will find help in our time of need. So if you are here today and your soul is sin sick, come to Jesus. If you are here today and the fears, anxieties, and pressures of the world, this cultural moment, feel like they are about to bury you. Look to the heavens. In these moments, if you're like me, where we struggle to really surrender all, it is a desire that we have, but in reality we know we have not surrendered all, but we know that Jesus is worth it. Would you this day Say, whatever it is that stands between me and you, whatever it is that would raise itself up against the glory of Jesus, I surrender that today. We have a prince of peace who reigns in chaos, a king who still sits over the cosmos, a friend who cannot forget us. Someone who loves us, Jesus the Christ, who in price that cannot be calculated, in a way unthinkable, would make a way for us to be reconciled to God through his shed blood at Calvary, but securing that salvation in his resurrection. And reminding us. So in the stillness of where you are, pour your heart out to Jesus. Fear not if the words sound good. Sometimes all we know how to do is groan. But the Spirit knows how to translate. Jesus, receive these prayers. May they be pleasing to you. Help us to have our hearts fixed on you this day. We desperately need you. So help us to take all of our anxiety and all of our cares and to lay them at the foot of the cross and leave them. Help us to trust that the government can sit on your shoulders and it will not break you. And that we have hope. Help us to savor the goodness of Jesus. And enjoy this time remembering what he has done. For we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. This morning we are going to take the Lord's Supper together. If you are a guest with us here at the orchard, we want you to know that if you have placed all your hope and trust in Jesus Christ then we welcome you to celebrate with our family today as we partake 
If you're over in the family experience, I want you to know, little ones, I know there's going to be questions. Mom and dad may have this, and you may not get to take it. That's okay. You can talk to them about why. Ask them to tell you why everybody doesn't take it. Ask them to explain to you why Jesus is so special and what it is that we're supposed to remember through these simple elements. I'm going to ask our deacons, if you would, to go ahead and begin to serve. They will come by and they'll pass it to you. Everything is uh, self-contained here in this little packet. So as it comes by, to those of you who are family of God in Christ, please take one. What a privilege it is for us to celebrate this together. The Apostle Paul, in giving instruction to the Corinthian church, said that on the night that he was betrayed, taking us back to the reality of things, taking us back to the great truth, that while we come and celebrate this meal, there was an incredible, extraordinary event that took place to secure its meaning for us. For you see, if you're here today and, and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, fully surrendered, that's okay, we're glad you're here. If you're just asking questions about what it looks like to follow Jesus, we're glad that you're here. And in these symbols, please do not be obligated. We would encourage you just to watch because what happens in this moment, similar to other pivotal moments in our lives, is that we get to observe visually the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in the same way, if we're at a wedding and we recognize that the mystery describes Christ and his church, in the same way, these elements point to a greater drama, a cosmic drama that secured our hope. And so the Apostle Paul, in giving instruction, said that on the night he was betrayed, he took these elements, part of a Passover, a Passover feast that the, the Jewish people had held for centuries and he said, I want you to know, I'm giving you a new covenant. It's the same kind of picture. It's a willingness to accept a substitute on your behalf. That the picture of a Passover lamb, which Paul would go on to explain that Jesus is our Passover lamb. He said, so he said, there's a couple of things that I want you to take, and I want you to remember. And so this morning, there's a, there's a, thin film across the top. You'll find a, a wafer underneath there. As you take this, I want you to know this points to a greater reality. This does not turn itself into the body of Jesus. It is a picture of the body of Jesus. And the grand display of the gospel that we celebrate in this moment is this. It represents the fact that God took to himself a body that Jesus, the Christ, truly God and truly man, our high priest made like us in every single way except one, he had no sin, so that when he on the tree gave himself, the Bible tells us that he himself bore our sin in his body. Beloved, today is the Lord's day, and the most important thing that will happen is not to give yourself to what will happen later, but to give yourself to a sacred moment where we remember what Christ has done. Take and eat, all of you. Receive his gift of grace. And the Bible says that in the same way, he took a cup. Now, when it comes to the cup, this cup represents something far greater. This cup represents... His blood, it, it is the foundation for this new covenant that he gave us. A covenant of grace in what he would do. The Bible says that there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And so therefore, when we come to this place, this cup reminds us what we've sung for a long, long time. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so he took the cup and he said, remember, this is my blood given for you when you take this to it in remembrance of me. Beloved, take and drink. Remember your king. This memorial meal, if you will, is to remind us. So for those of you in the family experience, for those of you who finally got to take the kids over to preschool, 
Tell your kids the story of Jesus. Tell them why we do these things. Pass down so that the next generation will be able to testify to the mighty works of God. Because today, as we enter into the scripture, there is another great reality that Christ shared through this meal. He said, I want you to know this. I will no longer partake of this again until we are all together in the kingdom yet to come. So today, not only do we look back and see what Christ has done, we enjoy a present salvation and a grace so amazing, wonderful, and free. But we know that a greater glory and reality is yet to be revealed. And so this morning, I'm going to try not to start preaching before the sermon has actually begun. But don't look to an election for salvation. Look to Jesus who gave himself for you. You have hope no matter what Wednesday morning looks like. Do not lose hope. Hold fast to it. Let me pray for us, Christ. We thank you for your indescribable gift. We marvel at your kindness to us in Christ Jesus. We thank you for a grand cosmic reality that we are able to savor and enjoy as we think through what it means for us to be in Christ, what it means for us to enjoy these elements. And so I pray now, God, as we look at your word, would you help us to delight in you through your word? Would you help us to savor the goodness and grace of Jesus Christ? Would you captivate our thoughts and our attentions? Would you arrest our hearts so that we will not be scattered or distracted? Would you alone be the center, be the focus? I confess before these witnesses, there's nothing good in me but Jesus. And as your glad servant this day, I pray that you would take my mind and my mouth and my heart. And I pray that you would speak. But help us not to just hear your words, but to be doers of them also. So to that end, we give ourselves in this glad pursuit and pray it in the name of Jesus. And everyone who agrees with that prayer said, Amen. Amen. Welcome. So glad that you are here. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to the Gospel of Mark. Pastor Sam and I, beginning particularly this week, are going to pick up the pace. It's going to be an all-out sprint to the end. We will be digesting large chunks of the book. Praise the Lord. What an incredible grace. Pastor Sam and I have often remarked as we laid out this sermon before COVID was ever a thing, not knowing exactly how the weeks would line up, we marvel at the good hand of providence as we see the passages unfold before us. God is good. His word can be trusted. I want you to know that today I have not come to give you spiritual advice. I have come to put Christ before you and tell you that he is better. On this day, I have not come to entertain you and give you one more thing to do. I want you to know that there is an imminent coming king who already reigns. So lest I get carried away and start preaching, there's a running joke in our house. And the joke goes something like this. When the game gets down into, say, the fourth quarter, and the contest is still in doubt, and you get to things like, I don't know, a two-minute warning... The ongoing joke in our house is that two minutes might mean three days, that my hearing begins to fail, particularly if I'm highly invested in this game. It is amazing inside that two-minute warning that my son and I, as we watch the TV, we would be glad for them to put us on the coaching staff. We obsess over every detail. We think about the personnel. We think about the planes. We think about the clock management. We know exactly how we can win the game. And just because we can see that there's a possibility, we are absolutely focused and intense. So when people speak to us, it's not a willful disregard or disrespect. There is a deafness that happens between my son and I on the couch. It's a proximity deafness because I can hear you know, everything he says. I can hear the commentators. I can hear the crowd. I've got a, a good picture of what's going on, but everything else just kind of is happening. Evidently, life is still going on. 
And so when it comes to this, we obsess over every little thing. We are yelling at guys who cannot hear us, who are states away, telling them to get out of bounds. What are you doing, you dummy? We yell at the coaches as if through their headset. They should know that we're going, that's the wrong play to call. He never gets that right. The other thing that is amazing is our voices get louder and louder as the end approaches, right? And in the words of the old uh, ABC sports, sometimes you get the thrill of victory, or I could still see that skier just tumbling into oblivion, the agony of defeat, right? And at the end of it, we are sometimes exhilarated at the heights of joy, and sometimes it is as if we have just lost our way. To quote Hee Haw, it is gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery, oh, right? But there's something that happens recognizing that the game is about to end that focuses us. There's something that happens that draws my son together in like, you know, we may have all of our other issues. He is a middle school boy after all. Pray for us. We appreciate it. But in that moment, we are united and we know We can win this, right? Well, that's the kind of moment that we've arrived at today in our passage. And as we pick up, one disciple is going to make a comment about an extraordinary sight that he sees, the temple, and that one comment is going to open up something that will absolutely devastate, confuse And leave them asking question after question after question. And I can tell you that a couple of millennia later, we're still asking the same questions. So if you have your Bibles, Mark chapter 13, buckle up. I'll just tell you, this is one of the things that I love to do. So bear with me. I know wiggles, giggles, and small ones in the family experience know this. We're going to read a lot of scripture right now. All 37 verses. And let me just tell you, this is a firm conviction. I love the public reading of the Word, and I love reading it in chunks. So bear with me, because we're going to have a good time. Ready? Look at your neighbor and tell them the title of the sermon is Stay Awake, Live It Out Right Now. Good job. Chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, the Scripture says this. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher. What wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew, they asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. There are but, these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Be on your guard. For they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say. But say, whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader take note, understand, then those 
Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down nor enter his house or take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, shows he shortened the days and then if anyone says to you look here is the Christ or look there he is do not believe it for false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray if possible the elect be on your guard I've told you all these things beforehand but in those days after that tribulation the sun will be darkened And the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven, from the fig tree. Learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near. At the very gates, truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. And when he leaves his home and he puts his servants in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, and he's repeated it several times. Stay awake. May God bless the reading of his word. Receive it as his living word today. There are things in this that I'll just go ahead and tell you. I do not have any intention of going into all of the eschatological plans of the end of days. I will not be telling you whether it's pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, ah-mill, pre-mill. That's not what we're here to do today. Because that wasn't Jesus' major thrust either. His major thrust for us is stay awake. And so they go out. Finally, this unending conflict that they've been in forever, we've been reading about it, whether it's Sadducees or Pharisees or scribes or priests or Herodians, over and over and over. Everybody wants to take a shot at Jesus. He is hours from the apex of human history. From the most significant event that will ever, ever be recorded where he gives his life and rises from the dead. And as they're coming out, they look and they see one of the most magnificent structures of its day. See, this is Herod's temple. And no matter how you picture the temple, Herod's temple vastly outsized every other version. The engineering feats that he accomplished He's known for his construction projects, but this one was particularly incredible. And as they would look to limestone, using all different kinds, knowing just where to put them and just how to stagger them, whether you would see the sun as it hit this bright white limestone or the gold that would trim it and your eyes would be blinded for a moment. One of the disciples turns around and he just admires it. We know that feeling. That feeling that there are great things that we don't really understand that happen. That moment of beauty that captures us where we just see something and go, wow, what a God. And this disciple, who Mark leaves unnamed, just says, look, teacher, what wonderful buildings. What a magnificent thing to look at. And Jesus says something that absolutely devastated them. He'd already been warming up for this. He told them in John chapter 2 that I want you to know you could tear this temple down in three days. 
I'll put it back together again. And he was not talking about Herod's structure. The Bible tells us he was talking about his own body. But you got to understand, for these Jewish men, this was a threat to everything that they held dear. This was the great symbol of Jewish nationalism. This was the religious epicenter of all of Israel. This was the identifier, the icon. This was the place where the presence of God would dwell. This was the place where all of their instruction about Torah and how to follow God, this is the place where they would see things that they had only dreamed about in their synagogues and towns. And Jesus said, I want you to know, not one bit of it's going to be left. Beloved, let me say this to you, and I say this lovingly, and I'm preaching to myself first. Your identity is not found in being an American or a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent or a Libertarian or whatever you want to put the Ian on the end of. Your identity is found in Jesus Christ. And Paul says in Philippians that we are citizens of heaven. We're also citizens in here. Be a good citizen. But if your hope is built on nationalism and symbols, instead of the Lord Jesus Christ, your hope is misplaced. We are nearing a cultural moment such as one that we haven't seen in a long time. The pressures are unbelievable. The way that people are behaving is unthinkable. And all of this has us going doomsday moment Wednesday morning. Pay attention. Does it mean that you don't participate? It doesn't mean that what you do doesn't matter. But what it means is that my hope and the greatest amount of energy, affection, love, or hate will not be given to those things. The greatest energy, attention, love, and hate for sin will be given to Jesus. So he says, not one stone is going to be on top of that. It's unthinkable. They knew the manpower. It took 46 years to put this place together. It was magnificent. It still boggles engineers' minds today. Even just some of the small things about offsetting stones is this incredible steep climb. The architecture, the engineering, it's absolutely incredible. And Jesus says, there's not going to be one thing there. And it's just unthinkable. How in the world can not one stone be on? Because some of these stones weigh tons. How could that even be? But it's funny because the first thing that happens is when they finally get over to the Mount of Olives, they got questions, right? And so Peter, James, John, and they brought Andrew along this time. I don't know if they were looking for fish and loaves, but they brought him along anyway. Then they asked Jesus privately. When's all this going to happen? When's this thing going to go down? And notice what Jesus said. See that no one leads you astray. Because when it comes to this, I want you to know looks and words can be deceiving. Looks and words can be deceiving. You say, what are you talking about? Well, we've been listening to Jesus engage the religious leaders. And boy, they look good. Jesus said they love those greetings in the marketplace. They make long prayers. They give lots of money. But looks can be deceiving. Jesus would say to them, you bunch of whitewashed tombs. You look great on the outside, but on the inside you're absolutely dead. Looks and words can be deceiving. Everything that claims to be from Christ must be tested next to his word. Do not believe everything that you hear, or read on the Google machine. Just because somebody shared it on Facebook does not make it true. I know that's stunning. <laughs> read the word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not his word. You don't test things by popularity and polls. You test them by the book. Read the book. They want to know when these things happen. What are, what are we supposed to do? 
And so he says, listen, I don't want anybody to lead you astray because there's going to be a lot of people that claim me, that claim to be me. There's going to be people who are going to come in and they're going to say all kinds of things, but I need for you to understand what's going to happen. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Do not be alarmed. We can hear that today, right? Nation will rise against nation. What a stunning thing to think. Nations are fighting right now. And he goes through and he talks about earthquakes and famines, but he says, be on your guard. And here's what's going to happen. They're going to deliver you to councils, synagogues. You're going to get beaten. You're going to get imprisoned. You're going to have to do all sorts of things. Kings, governments, you're going to have to give an account. But I want you to take comfort in this. It's like he said, I'm going to give you the bad news first. And if it was me, I'm going, oof, can we get to some good news? I'm going to give you the bad news, but then I'm going to give you the good news. That in those moments, you will never be alone. No matter what religious leader, what political leader, what government thing happens, I want you to know you're not going to be alone, and I'm going to give you everything you need for that moment. Beloved, do you believe today that God will give you everything you need for Wednesday morning? If you're like me, cry out and say, help my own belief. Looks and words can be deceiving, and trouble should be expected. That's the second point. Trouble should be expected. We look, and we wag our heads, and we say, how did we get to this place? How can this be going on? I want you to know, in this world, you should expect trouble. 1 John 3, 13 says, do not be surprised, brothers, when the world hates you. Well, that's encouraging, Right? Why would you be surprised that when you tell somebody that you follow Jesus Christ, that they go, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. What, are you some kind of lunatic? What, are you some kind of religious fanatic? So you're telling me that you believe some Jewish guy from the first century is the king of the universe? That's exactly what I'm telling you. And I'm not telling you because I got duped. I'm telling you because the Holy Spirit of the living God through his word pierced my heart and raised me to life. I was saved by grace through faith. It is his word. Trouble should be expected. Some of you are going, bruh, 2020, right? I mean, let's be honest. Expect trouble, hashtag 2020. That could be a bumper sticker, a t-shirt right there. But he says this, he goes on, he says, I I want you to know there's going to be all these things, but the one who endures to the end, this is verse 13, the end of it, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Listen to me, faith is always moving forward, it's always going somewhere. Faith is always moving forward, it is always going somewhere. Do not see yourself as the victim of your circumstances. Acts 17 says that God put you in this place, in this time, in this nation for his glory. You're not the victim of your circumstances. You belong to Jesus, body and soul, and everything is under his lordship. Every enemy is his footstool. The Lord said to my Lord, remember last week's sermon? Sit at my right hand till I make every enemy your footstool. Guess what? Check the box. The enemy's head has been crushed. He's on borrowed time. The end is about to unfold. We're going to read some very exciting things, right? Verse 14, he picks up. But when you see the abomination of desolation, I just, well, that's, that gets you going, doesn't it? I mean, that's like Kirk Cameron, last days, left behind somebody. Uh, I mean, you just start reading that, and you're like, what am I supposed to do with that? Right? Standing where he ought not to be. And when it comes to these things, regardless of where you stand on end times and what you believe, the two predominant things are that's either something that's not yet happened or that's something that happened in AD 70 when when Titus came in and sacked Jerusalem. But the point is this. Jesus gives them instructions and he says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And if you're on the housetop, don't go down, don't take anything out, don't turn around, don't go back and get your cloak and pray. Notice verse 18. He goes through all this stuff, but he says, pray, and it might not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human would be saved. Can I tell you something? When it comes to this world, Jesus himself said, We are not at the hands of our enemy. 
Jesus is still ruling. He's the one who decides how short the day will be. He's the one who will cut things short. He's the one who from the four winds, meaning everywhere, will keep and save his people to the uttermost. When it comes to understanding and looking at this, Jesus said, pray. I want you to know when it comes to where we are, pray. God is at work right now. Even when things are bad, God is at work. Pray. Your prayers matter. Because God told us to do it, and if we don't obey, that matters too. Pray. You don't need one more talk show or one more news entertainment outlet to tell you what to think. What you need is to plead upon the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ and ask the Lord to show himself strong and powerful, to shut the mouths of those who would be skeptic and hardened to the truth that Jesus lives and reigns. Pray for our country. Pray for our communities. Pray for our families. Pray. It matters. Because he moves on, and in verse 24, here it comes, in those days after the tribulation, and he uses prophetic language, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heaven will be shaken. And then everyone, they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Because the reality is the king is coming. The king is coming. Now for me, when I grew up in church, boy, I can just hear that song. Y'all don't know that song, it's okay. But the king is coming. And here the trumpet's sounding, and now his face I see. Oh, the king is coming. The king is coming, and praise God, he's coming for me. I want you to know there's an election coming, but the king is coming. Hear me. Don't forget this on Tuesday night and Wednesday morning. The king is coming. And when he rolls this out, he wants you to know that event is certain. It is fixed. It is set. And the point of us is not to try to figure out. Our primary concern is not to figure out how many blood moons divided by how many nations times the armies will tell us exactly when the Mayan calendar lined up with the moons and all those things and the comet hit. Our instructions are clear because he repeats it over and over and over and over again. Stay awake. Be on your guard. Stay awake. Be on your guard. Stay awake. Be on your guard. Stay awake. You say, okay, great, John. Wonderful. But stay awake. I get it. What am I supposed to do? Let me give you three things to do. First one is this. Watch. You say, okay, well, I don't know what that means. Watch. Like, the wristwatch, Apple watch, what are we talking about here? I'm saying, watch your soul. Watch the word. Watch what is happening around you. It matters. He gave us the, the, the story. He says, it's like a man who goes away. And everybody's got the thing that they're supposed to do. And we're supposed to be watching. Watching and waiting. Looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. Watch your soul. Sin matters to God. It should matter to us. Fight it. Put it to death. Watch his word. See what he is going to say, what he's going to give you by the Holy Spirit. Pray. Dear ones, pray, pray. You go, I don't know what to say. I, don't, I can't pray that long. I'm not even that good at it. That's okay. Pray. If you're not sure what to say, get the word, turn every sentence into a prayer. Pray. And the last thing, work. Go to your jobs, show people that Jesus makes a difference in your life. Make every place that you go, school, work, the grocery store, make it better because somebody who loves Jesus was there. You see, we don't need to go get in the bunker somewhere and just hope how everything is going to fold out. 
The king is coming. The end is fixed. The enemy is already defeated. He's on borrowed time, and it will not last. And nothing is greater than King Jesus. Watch, pray, work, stay awake. Because just like at my house, what would it be like if Christians recognized we hit the fourth quarter a long time ago at a thing called Pentecost? What would happen for Christians if we began to pay such close attention to every detail, taking everything under the lordship of Jesus, thinking everything in the direction toward bringing him glory and that being our aim and the win? What would happen as our voices got louder saying, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved? What would happen if the people of God didn't descend into hate and vitriol and every form of social media? What would happen if the people of God looked around and said, the king is coming. Be a good citizen. Go and vote and love your neighbor and do your job with excellence. But don't do it because your hope is there. Do it because you belong to Jesus. And you will love him with every fiber of your being and you will love your neighbor as yourself. On a week where there's a lot of things that history has yet to unfold, one thing is certain. The king reigns. Trust him. And if you are here today and you say, I don't know, man, you're like way over the top on this. You seem so intense about it. I can't help it. I know we're in the fourth quarter, and I'm praying for you today. If you have not repented of your sin and put all of your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, I implore you on behalf of the living God today, do not leave this place without finding me, Pastor Sam, someone else is saying, I need Jesus. I need him to save me. I don't even know what that means, but I need it. If you were here and you are so fearful Lay it at his feet and say, I don't know what the implications are. I don't know what to tell my kids. I don't know what this is going to mean economically or socially. I have no idea what this is going to do for religious liberty or all those things. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I will not trust politics, governments, armies, or the economy. I will solely lean on Jesus' name. Worthy. It's your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Pray. Watch. Work. The king is coming. The fourth quarter is already there. We're almost home. Don't lose hope. Move forward. Take the next step. Let's pray. God, thank you. Oh, what a hope. I'm so slow and so small and so dumb and so rebellious. I'm so foolish and misguided, and I spend so much energy and effort on all the wrong things. Oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to save me from myself? Oh, my king, save me. Save us. Give us eyes to see heavenly realities, glorious things. Transform our hearts. Teach us to see Jesus in everything. Oh, how desperately we need you. Oh, how much we need you. So on this day, for the one who is here and says, I had no idea we were even in the fourth quarter. I didn't even know that Jesus loved me. I had no idea that he welcomes everybody who is messed up, broken down, and has failed more times than they can count. I pray that they will fly to the wounds of Jesus and find salvation. And for the soul weary today that said, John, I, just, I need a little Jesus. I need some encouragement. I pray today that they would lift their eyes to the hills, to the heavens. Where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And though the mountains crumble and fall into the heart of the sea, we will not fear. We're pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned. We're put down, but we're not destroyed. We're blessed beyond the curse, and Jesus' promise will endure. He will be our strength. So in these days, make us like you, because I look way too much like me. Change me. Let me hate my sin. 
Help me love my king, Jesus, a million lifetimes would not be enough to tell you how much I love you. So help me love you more. Bless this family. Change the way we see. For I pray it in the only name that saves. The only God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to him be glory, both now and forevermore. Amen.